for almost 35 years of development from the time he met Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati to the time he actually came over on the boat. The hardships he had to go through to get to America and the hardships he had to endure while being in America despite all these things and how his mission developed and how in the very beginning of the mission in 26 Second Avenue in 1965, Prabhupada was already writing the whole doctrine of Krishna consciousness and those seven principles which are the foundation of all the activities that are, that are there in the Hare Krishna movement. It's amazing. And Prabhupada didn't add anything too much from 1965 to now as far as what, what our society is about. He spelled it all out in the very beginning, in the early days. And then now, and then we went on to see what, what are those principles that Prabhupada spoke about in practical action. And who remembers what were the four, four missions of Srila Prabhupada, the four things that he wanted? What was the first one? Yeah. We have our dedicated mic runner. Okay, there he is. Uh, books and Harinam. Books and Harinam. The first that was the beginning and the foremost. You can you can mention all all of them if you know them. Yes. So, I know the second one is uh, temple and deity worship. Opening temples Opening. and establishing deity worship. Yeah. That's, we've done that all around the world with some most amazing temples and very elaborate forms of deity worship. And third? Congregation initiation. Congregational development and the importance of coming up to the standard of being initiated by a bona fide spiritual master. So these are three of the four points of Prabhupada's mission. And what was the last one? Devi Varnashram. Hmm? Devi Varnashram. Daivi Varnashram, yeah. Devi, not Devi. Daivi. <laughs> Devi is a little different. <laughs> Daivi Varnashram, and that is uh, Varnashram, which is spiritually oriented. That is, that devotees work in serving the Lord, and the goal is to go back to home, back to Godhead, but working according to their propensity, engaging people according to their abilities, and developing a social, um, what we say, arrangement based on that. Uh, that's one of our weaknesses yet in our movement, or one of the unfulfilled plans of Srila Prabhupada, a social system. We have a good spiritual system, there's no question about that. Social system still yet to be developed, how to take care of devotees and how to engage others as they come into Krishna consciousness. So that's Daivi Van Ashram and the ideal atmosphere to develop that is farm communities or simple living uh, depending on nature, depending on God for our needs and developing a community type of atmosphere which allows for each and every devotee to get both individual needs in the present and whatever they need all the way to the end of their life. You know. uh, so that is still, uh, we saw that the other three principles are already in place, going nicely, expanding, developing. You can go around the world and you'll see them. Temples are still opening. Devotees are still getting initiation. Congregations are developing. We have our Bhakti Vriksha every year. The Bhakti Vriksha program is bringing more and more people in from the congregation. And uh, chanting, dancing, Harinams, Kirtan programs, it's expanding. But still we don't have a social system. <laughs> oh, pretty well. <laughs> I thought I thought of, I was wondering what statue is over there. <laughs> I was thinking somebody put some statue over here. <laughs> I didn't want to look because I was afraid of what to see what it was. But I... <laughs> oh, thank you. 
Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, yeah, we haven't been able to do that yet. So, Barely Begun was the title. So, we discussed that and Prabhupada's desire for Van Ashram, how he said in 1974, yeah, okay, Van Ashram is nice, but society's too mixed up, so let's just let's just focus on spreading the holy name. That's the panacea for all success in this age. But then he saw within our own society, devotees were leaving. And he was wondering, why? Why are devotees leaving so much? Why are they having so much difficulty? Well, because they're not engaged properly. They're not getting their needs taken care of. So Prabhupada said, we must establish Van Ashram. And then 1974, March 14th, he gave a landmark talk on Van Ashram. It's a, it's a lecture in Vrindavan, and uh, I think it's almost an hour and a half long. It's a really a, a long morning walk when Prabhupada answers a lot of questions. And devotees are firing questions on Prabhupada about Van Ashram. It's a really a good dialogue between the devotees and Prabhupada. Please take an opportunity and listen to that lecture. And then in 1976, he said, we must establish Van Ashram. This is the only way, you know, not only for our society, but for the world in general. People are so mixed up, they can't practice spiritual life properly. So we need this system. And in 77, he really emphasized it, so much so that he was going to show on a personal, in a personal way how to implement Van Ashram by doing it himself. Unfortunately, his health, you know, took a turn for the worse and he wasn't able to do that. But this is what Prabhupada wanted. And then we read that one statement. What was that one statement when someone asked, when Prabhupada said, uh, I have one lamentation, uh, le lamina one lamentation. It was Abhiram Prabhu asked him, what is that lamination? Lamentation, not lamination, lamentation. Uh, someone, someone had thought that it would be that he didn't get to finish the Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh, yeah. But actually Prabhupada said that it was because he didn't st establish Varnashram Dharma. Yeah, someone said, your lamentation, Prabhupada, is you haven't finished Varnashram. Prabhupada said, no, it's because we have it. Fifty percent of my mission is incomplete or unfinished. And so he left the world with the giving us the other fifty percent to do. Uh, we find it, what we say, easy, or not easy, but easier to keep the first three going. But the social system seems to be a real struggle, especially in the Kali Yuga age where everything is so mixed up and people don't know what they're supposed to do or how to practice spiritual life effectively. So that's being worked on. We've established farm communities, but although we have established farm communities, the system still needs to be, what we say, developed even within the communities itself. So this is where we left off. Uh, yeah. And that was called finding our mission in the mission. Although we didn't go into that one too much in detail, that was a separate session. It, that's what it's all about, in the Van Ashram system. Learning how to serve in the most possible way and inspiring leadership to bring devotees to that level of commitment. Okay, any questions or comments on what we've discussed so far before we begin our next lesson? Yes, Richard. Wait, everyone, yeah, yeah. Uh, you get the mic, wait, wait till the microphone comes and then you can speak. Okay. Hi, right, Krishna Maharaj. It may be a detail that you're, you're going to cover, but I was just wondering, farm communities... Do they do Harinam? Or, like, I guess I'm just wondering the... the Hare Krishna chanting is there. You go to Hungary, it's a big farm community, and on festival days they do seven, eight hours, nine hours of kirtan <laughs> on the festival days. And during the week, the day-to-day -day life, they have kirtan in the morning, kirtan in the evening for at least an hour and a half. So, because of that, the community is successful. <laughs> 
It's not so much because of the farming, but because of the, the holy name. The holy name makes everything happen. The holy name is the foundation for everything. All success is dependent on chanting Hare Krishna. But if we want to go beyond, if we want to develop anything, we have to keep the holy name foremost. You can't push that aside and just, you know, do other things because it's the Yuga Dharma. It's the Yuga Dharma. It's the it's the means for self-realization in this age. Lord Chaitanya emphasizes it, and the Charyas glorify it as the way for perfection in spiritual life. May I ask one small question on oh, top of that? Only if you agree to to acknowledge or not acknowledge my previous answer. <laughs> I, okay. You agree or disagree? Oh, I completely agree, 100%. Okay, next question. <laughs> as long as you agree, we can go on. <laughs> yeah, that for sure, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, if you don't agree, then we have to go back over it again. <laughs> Uh, then, then is it's the, not a, just a matter of talking; it's a matter of getting communication. Communication does talking doesn't necessarily mean communication. That's one way. Communication means to to actually pick up what one the person is saying, and either acknowledge it or respond to it in one way or another. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. Next one. Then, you know, you mentioned that in the cities there's an emphasis on preaching. And I was wondering that, in your opinion, then would it be that there would be more Harinam in the city structures, like temple type atmospheres, than there would be in a farm community, or you think it would be equal? That'll come up in this lesson. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna. Okay, good. Charya Nishta. <coughs> Maharaj, I, I think we touched briefly on this yesterday on the Varnashram topic, uh, but I was a little more inquisitive. Uh, one of the issues that I had a little difficulty coming to ISKCON was the fact um, of how we get our milk and the huge emphasis we place on the, how dear the cows are to Krishna. Right. Yet all of our centers, yeah. most over the world, we're getting our milk from very, very abominable circumstances. Yeah. And we don't seem to be much concerned or doing much in that way. We see Prabhupada... I know, I know one senior devotee when he was confronted by a, a veganist who was a leader in that area, he decided to stop drinking milk unless it became... I won't mention the person's name. He's a leading devotee in our movement. He's an acharya, he's a sannyasi, he's a guru. But he acknowledged that, yeah, we can't be hypocritical. If we're going to talk about cow protection, we have to follow that principle. Therefore, we should have our own milk. We should get milk from cows that are protected and not going to be slaughtered or have our own farms, either one. Yeah. Just like when people come to our temple, they see styrofoam cups and, you know, and styrofoam plates. I'm not, we used to have that here, but I think that's been gone now. They say, yeah, you're talking about, you know, you know God, but you're destroying the ecology. You know. So we can't profess a particular philosophy and then not follow it ourselves in terms of what we do. You know, people will not take us seriously. They may not take us seriously on the more serious issues if they see we're not following the smaller ones also. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Okay, so love is to cooperate. So, this one is the Next one. So we'll begin. First, someone can... Where is that, anyway? Anybody know? Close. <laughs> it's close. Yes. Who knows? It's the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And what room is that? That's Prabhupada's room and Bhaktivedanta Manor, and that Shruti Kirti giving Prabhupada a massage, and that's Bali Mardan there with Prabhupada. So, so um, let's see. To love is to cooperate. Okay. So I'll read something, and then you can respond to this. 
Srila Prabhupada, this is from Shruti Kirti. All of your disciples have so much love for you. It makes me feel so bad. I lack this intense love. When I was with you at the airport, I can see everyone dancing, chanting, and crying. I have so much association with you, yet I don't feel this overwhelming love like they do. I hope he would... He, he's, he's reflecting now. I hope he would say something to re- relieve my mind. He remained silent. <laughs> Tormented. I finished his massage and went back to my room to finish preparing his lunch. After he chanted Gayatri Mantra, he called me into his room. As I entered, I offered my obeisances and looked up with great concern because he had such a serious look on his face. Do you like serving me, he said. I said, oh yes, Prabhupada. I said, I like serving you very much. Someone read? To love is to serve. So you just do your service, he continued. That is all that is necessary. That is what love means, to do service. Hmm. And Prabhupada says, everyone... And everyone can do so many things, singing, dancing, jumping up and down, but you are actually doing something. Isn't this love? (laughs) So love means to serve. (laughs) So what Prabhupada's explaining that, you know, bhakti means to do something. Um, Bhakti means devotional service, or bhakti in action is devotional service. Chanting and dancing is also service, and it's a very important type of service. But then again, there's a mission here. The mission is to spread Krishna consciousness. The mission is to carry on the needs of the society, both the temple and the society. So Prabhupada is asking us, if you really have some concern for me, if you really appreciate what I'm giving you, then reciprocate by doing something. (laughs) Do some service. Love means to serve. Okay. Here's another meaning of love. Cooperate. So, the prelude to that statement was, Prabhupada said to Tamal Krishna, I'll give you a little background from that one. He said, uh, Prabhupada said, I want to write a will. I want to call all the devotees together and I want to make a will. And the will, writing of the will would not be done with the attitude that the end has come, but in the spirit of preparing for the worst. It also meant finishing things so they would not have to be done in the last minute. This is from, Tamal, this is from uh, the Lilamrita. Prabhupada was concerned that his movement continues securely with all ISKCON properties in the possession of his disciples within the institution, and all his instruction made clear for the future. These matters should be dispatched now in a will, and the GBC men should gather in Vrindavan to make these last arrangements and to be with him. Once these things were settled, Prabhupada would be free to continue writing his books with no worries. So he was worried about the future of his institution once he would depart. Tamal Krishna wanted to double check to see that Prabhupada actually wanted all the GBC men from all over the world to come. It would be costly and demanding, so he wanted to make sure that Prabhupada really wanted it. When Srila Prabhupada assured him that he did, Tamal Krishna, who saw his service as responding to whatever Srila Prabhupada desires, also spoke in favor of the idea. And he said, because they love you, Srila Prabhupada, I'm sure they will want to come to be with you. And then Prabhupada made this statement. Your love for me will be shown how much you cooperate to keep the institution together after I'm gone. That's tough. So love means to cooperate, love means to serve. Oh. 
Srila Prabhupada emphasized, your love for me will be tested how after my departure you maintain this institution. We have glamour and people are feeling our weight. This should be maintained. Mm. Yeah, we have glamour. We're noted. The society is, people are seeing it. We have some weight now. That was back in 77. <laughs> so I guess we have a little more weight now. <laughs> after 35 years since then. So, uh, any questions? What does it mean? Love means to cooperate. Yeah. What is your name? Edward. Edward. Okay, Edward. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, how we should be perceiving the institution of ISKCON um, versus strictly following Srila Prabhupada's teachings. Because at least my understanding is Vedas are eternal, but an institution isn't necessarily. Yeah. How should we follow? Well, that's up to the leaders to disseminate and to explain Prabhupada's teachings. Reading the books, having classes, discussing them. The Prabhupada instituted a thing called Istagosti. Istagosti means all the devotees within the temple or yatra get together and they discuss how to carry on the activities of the affairs of the, the temple and the yatra. It's a discussion type of thing. And then there's different ways. Uh, it takes communication, and communication means to organize. We have to organize opportunities to communicate and dispel all differences or disagreements and all, um, what we say, things that are unclear about what Prabhupada is expecting and how things are going on from day to day. So it's a practical plan, a plan to practically put in place the philosophy. Knowledge is called jnana. Jnana, the term jnana means knowledge or philosophical knowledge, but vigyan, vigata, means intensification of knowledge or realized knowledge or practical application of knowledge. So devotional service is practical application of philosophical teachings. How to make things happen by applying the teachings in a day-to-day -day life, wherein the society moves forward and the individual also becomes more and more Krishna conscious. So that's, that's a program. <laughs> that's why we need to discuss Prabhupada's books Regularly, we have our Bhagavatam classes, we have our Gita classes. Um, it's not that one person speaks and everybody just listens. We should also ask questions. Asking questions means getting clarifications on ideas and answers. And also offering something practical in terms of how to, how to increase the service within the temple or how to increase the quality of whatever service is already going on. This can be done by the devotees and noted by the leaders and put in place in that way. So there has to be communication. If there's no communication, then nothing really happens. <laughs> yes, Asraya. Excuse me, Hare Krishna. <clears throat> On this point of being able to discuss and understand the things better amongst ourselves, a phenomenon that I have witnessed, perhaps been a part of to whatever extent, is within a community setting there are persons who are guiding others. And so faith is placed in those persons as authorities to some extent, whoever we may be. And um, to question those persons sometimes is something that is a little bit... Um, difficult? Difficult in one sense and also maybe discouraged so it's like I don't mean like in an institutional way discouraged but you know that's that's a that's a, that's an idea that has somehow or other been filtered in and misunderstood you can always question authority but you have to follow authority at the same time when you question authority you can question but then you have to follow <laughs> the question is to get clarification to get an understanding but then, ultimately, the authority has to ultimately give the final statement. Still, we have to follow. Without following authority, where are we? We have, we're nowhere. We follow, we create a, a false authority, 
and then we just do what we want. Therefore, authority is the principle. Krishna is the ultimate authority, and he, bring, he makes that knowledge known to those who are fully surrendered to him. And then that filters down, and we have what we call an, an echelon of authority on all levels. So without that, nothing's going to work. <laughs> Even if the authority is imperfect, still the authority principle has to be there. But ultimately, it's not like we have to follow authority blindly. We can ask questions when it's time, when, you, when there's some need to ask questions for clarification, for direction of activity. That can be there. Authorities shouldn't be offended by devotees asking questions about what they do or what they dictate. But at the same time, ultimately, the devotees have to be humble and accept whatever is given at the, as the ultimate at the end of the discussion, ultimately, they, one has to follow the authority. So, Prabhupada says, the leaders have to be very affectionate to the followers, and the, the followers have to be very uh, obedient to the leaders. If the leaders are not affectionate, affection it means they care about the, leader, the followers. They go out of their way to help the devotees in their service. But ultimately, the devotees have to cooperate and surrender to the authority. <laughs> so there's affection and following. <laughs> if the leaders remain aloof from the uh, followers and expect the followers to follow them, it may not happen. There has to be a relationship. Relationship has to be there. <laughs> Well, the relationship has to develop because we can't just surreptitiously create an authority structure without the idea of the element of bhakti. The element of bhakti is the element of love. The element of love is we're trying to love Krishna and we also have to learn how to work together and, and find relationships with each other. So it's a family. That's, that's how it's set up. And we're creating a consciousness that we're trying to develop this mood of bhakti, which will bring us back to Krishna in the spiritual world, and we join the, the greater spiritual family. So we create this family here within the society of Isko. But ultimately, there has to be obedience. <laughs> so it's coming from two sides. It's just like in a family. If the, the wife has her role, the husband has their role. If the wife plays the role and the husband doesn't play the role, the wife's role is going to be affected by the husband not playing his role, and vice versa. So both the leaders have to play their role and the, the followers have to play their role. <laughs> okay? Is that, that's the, that's the, print, the, the basic precept of what we say, how to move forward Okay, does that make sense? Oh, I see a few hands went up. Charya Nishta was first, and then Janaki Nath, you had your hand up? Okay. Also, you had your hand up. On this particular point, cooperation, I was wondering how we can understand some of Prabhupada's, uh, you know, very dedicated disciples leaving the movement, how we can make sense of that. How can we understand how, why someone who apparently was so dedicated has left the movement? There may be different reasons. There is different reasons. There's not one reason why somebody leaves. What would you like to me to say? One of the reasons? <laughs> one of the possible reasons why people leave? I don't know. It just seems to go against what Prabhupada's indicating here. Uh, there's external surrender, and then there's internal surrender. If we don't come to the point of internal surrender, our external surrender may not may, may be maintained. So we can surrender, but then again, and we can be very dedicated, but if we're not actually purifying our heart in the process of bhakti, then our material desires and attachments may become strong again and lead us back to the material energy. That's one reason. The other thing is offenses. Sometimes you commit offenses against Vaishnavas, and then that also destroys your creeper. That's another reason why devotees leave for committing offenses. 
Krishna drives them out. Krishna drives the offenders out if they're long-term offenders. Oh, well, that's another reason. Another reason why is when Prabhupada left the planet, many persons were attached to Prabhupada on his vapu. And when Prabhupada was gone, they also felt, well, what is the use now? But Prabhupada explained, vapu may be beneficial or may not be beneficial. But Vani is what sustains the devotee in their relationship with the spiritual master. So Vani means the instructions. So we have to take the instructions into the heart. So these are some of the possible reasons why people leave. leave. Yeah, I guess um, particularly I was referring to not necessarily leaving the practice of devotional service, but just practicing outside of ISKCON, perhaps... Going to another spiritual movement? Yeah, or not being affiliated so longer with this movement, but they're still practicing, they're still... So, I guess you said general re varying reasons. That could be for many reasons. Bad experiences with certain devotees in the movement have caused them to leave. Or some not understanding Prabhupada's books fully, thinking that they can get more philosophical teachings outside. Prabhupada's personal servant did that. He was a personal servant, then he went to another guru, and he asked Prabhupada, can I have permission? Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> you want me my permission to go to cut my throat? Is that what you said? <laughs> he said. He, and Bhakti Charu Maharaj is very strong in making this point that everything we need to know philosophically is in Prabhupada's books. And he's brought that out in his lectures. How we, if we carefully understand what Prabhupada is saying, we'll see that everything is in his books. We don't need to go anywhere else. It's all coming through the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So sometimes people don't understand that. They think Prabhupada was very basic, very simple, very preliminary. And now the movement has grown and we need, we need something more. Mm -hmm. But that's because they don't really study Prabhupada's books carefully to see. If you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's nothing basic about that. Those purports are amazing purports. They're very difficult to understand and very deep in both tattva and leela. Not just the le tattva, but also deep in the leelas too. People leave because of the, they say the tattva is there, but the leelas are not there. But the leelas are also there. Or the leelas are there, but the tattva doesn't go deep enough into the leelas. But that's, that's also, what we say, a oversight on their part. They're not seeing the whole thing clearly. So, and many, practically every scholar that was a scholar in ISKCON left. <laughs> Because they studied Prabhupada from a scholarly point of view without understanding the devotional aspect deep enough. <laughs> Except for Gopi Paranandana, he was amazing. He was an amazing scholar and also very deep in his own devotional service. He's one of the few scholars that stayed with Prabhupada his whole life. Dravida <laughs> is another one. Ridayananda Maharaj is another one. These are all scholar devotees. <laughs> like that. So you have to be careful if you get too scholarly. <laughs> you might take issue with Prabhupada. <laughs> and that's happened too. Yes, Johnny Kinath? Hare Maharaj. Maharaj, I'm just trying to understand um, the cooperation between the leader or the authority and the followers. Many times a, a follower may know that the leader or the authority has the right intention, but sometimes the approach may not be right. So, so I'm trying to understand how can you cooperate with the authority when there is a disagreement? Because should the follower just bite the bullet and just follow it anyways? But then that will become very mechanical and, and the relationship as, as will be long very as you, artificial. Well, if you make your presentation... And in a humble way, and then you'll get a response, or you get a you get a clarification on your question. And even if you don't like it, still you have to follow. 
What can you do? At one point you have to, that's the ultimate end of the discussion. You got to follow. But yeah, but a reasonable dis- discussion may change the way that the leader is presenting what he's presenting. He might say, well, yes, as I said this, but actually you can see it from this angle also. Any clarification? A lot of times the leaders either don't, they don't have time or they just don't spell out exactly what their, their intentions are when they give instructions or directions. You can't do that in a class. When you're giving the class, you speak on principles. When you get into discussion, you get into the details, and then you, then the principles become clear. Just like now, we're having a discussion type of class. But if I was given a class, I would just speak on principles. And then it's up to the devotees to raise the points, and then the discussion ensues, and then we can understand the principles from different angles. There's where questions and answers come in. So, yeah, question. If you listen to Prabhupada's talks, his devotees were questioning him a lot. (laughs) They even challenged him many times. And Prabhupada didn't mind that because he knew this was good because they they were serious about what he was saying. Even though they challenged him, still at the same time, he was very tolerant of that at the same time and just so he could present more and more information on what they wanted to hear. Um, and Prabhupada even did that on his morning walks. He would set up mock debates and present a topic and then discuss it from different angles of vision just to get clarifications. So this is our site. And Prabhupada says, Bodhiantas parasparam kotiantas chamam disyam tushyanti cha ramanti cha. He says, discuss things, talk about things. The philosophy, the leelas, Get into it. <laughs> we can have a very superficial approach to Krishna consciousness, but then again, Maya will have an uh, Maya will have an easy time picking us off. If you go deep into Krishna consciousness, and that requires to question, then you you can actually become really fixed in your consciousness on how to execute devotional service. Maya will have a hard time deviating you then. Because you're fixed. So in that relationship, yeah, ask questions. But be humble. If you're not humble, if you approach the leaders in a, in a less humble way, you may get something different than what you want to hear. <laughs> Therefore, humility is the means for communication in all aspects of relationship. Humble means... I'm questioning you because I want to hear your answer, not that I want to question you so you hear so you can agree with my answer, my question. <laughs> That's a difference, right? Okay. This, you can continue if you have more. In in principle, Margie, it definitely makes sense. But like when we go to the details, like I'll just give an example. Like, say you're doing a specific preaching project. And you come up with a strategy, and the authorities say, maybe, no, you shouldn't do this, you should do it this way. But it's your project, you know how it works, you've got the vision. Then, then there is like a, a clash there, you know? And it affects the relationship because then it becomes very artificial. Mm-hmm. Well, if, you, if we're looking at it from the point of view of the authority, the authority wants you to do the service, but at the same time, they want you to do it within a certain realm of activity. If they see that you, the way you're doing it may not be the best way, they may offer you advice. But my, my understanding is if you give a person a project, you should give them a chance to let them do it according to their, the best way they can possibly do it. But then again, they should also run it by the authorities and saying, what do you think? How am I doing? Got any ideas? Not like it's my project. And therefore, I don't need any advice either. So, again, both sides have to communicate. I'm talking about the ideal answer. Sometimes we're dealing with personalities, too. And that will come up in this discussion. That personalities are there, and differences of opinion will come simply by, by just by differences of personality. <laughs> 
We see that. When personalities clash, we have, when we say, different ideas that clash also. It's, sometimes the personalities clash. So we have to d tolerate that somehow. I like what you're saying, but the way you say it, I don't like it. <laughs> I had one. What your uh, name again? Is? Luke. Luke. Back to Luke. Okay. I had a question on um, kind of a related point, and also to the po the question of a Um I was wondering if you would say that peer relationships are also necessary uh, as we're cultivating relationships with superiors, because um, sometimes it's easier to disclose our mind in a very straightforward and honest manner to appear. Yeah. Whereas with the superior, where we have more, where yeah. we want to appear, you know, nicely before our superiors, naturally. Yeah, that's so. true. So, therefore, get prepared. <laughs> if it's serious enough, sometimes it's not even so serious. If it's serious, just prepare your mind on what you're going to say and how you're going to present it. And then also, uh, in relation to a Chinese question, um, the one thing I've heard from um, at least one devotee, if not a few, that when people get into very high position in the movement or in general... Who's the highest position? Krishna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Prabhupada said, talking about it on our level, he said, the more you're a servant, the higher you are. <laughs> so the higher position is one who's got the most service attitude. That's the highest position. Not by, what do we say, the uh, structural position of the institution. So I guess that's the highest position. The more you have, because Krishna is looking at your service attitude. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, well, this person's a, you know, a, a big guy, <laughs> therefore he's, you know, he's, he, sees, he sees what you do and what you say, not so much about what your position is. Some of the, some of the greatest devotees in our movement, we don't even know their names <laughs> because they're in the background doing, they're just doing service, that's all. They're not looking for position or recognition. There's one devotee in Miami. He's been going out on books for 40 years every day. He just goes out on books by himself. I don't even remember his name. They told me his name. Anybody know that book distributor in Miami? He doesn't even turn in his scores because he doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be known as you know for what scores he gets. He just goes out every day. So you know, so. Who's big and who's not big? <laughs> that way we can appreciate each and every devotee for what they're d doing and who they are rather than what position they have. Of course we respect position, but we should also respect the position of being the servant. That's the real position. Yeah. Thanks, Maharaj. I was hoping, will you discuss a little bit more on peer relationships in this part of the presentation? Peer relationships? Yeah. Be more specific. Uh, okay. Krishna, yeah, that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. If you, your relationship with peers is friendship. To make friends with your peers and to work together to serve, serve this, the devotees. Serve each other, serve your spiritual master, serve the Lord. That's mentioned in Bhagavatam in the 8th canto. No, 4th canto, 8th chapter, verse 34, where it talks about relationships with three levels. Those who are in a senior position, those who are equal, and those who are lesser. Those in the senior position, you hear from them and you offer service. Those who are in a less equal position, you make friends and share Krishna consciousness together. Those who are in a lesser position, you show compassion and you try to help them by raising them up to 
Krishna consciousness. So it's it's uh, the mood is uh, service, friendship, compassion. But all are in the mood of service, like that. Okay. Yes. Very patiently waiting to ask his question. Thank you. You kind of touched on this in your last answer, but it's my understanding that loving and serving the devotees through deeds is the same as loving and serving Krishna. Yeah. Is it the same when you are serving all sentient beings and not just the community of devotees? Well, Vinaya Vidya Vinaya Sampane Gavani Brahmani Gavani Hastani Suni Chaiva Sapakecha Pandita Sabadarshanaha. One who sees with equal vision, and the verse explains different types of living beings, one who sees each living being equally. They don't see the body, position, or anything. They see Krishna's in the heart of that living being. That's samadarshan. Dar- darshan means vision and sama means equal. One who sees with the equal vision all living entities. How you treat them may be different according to their position, but one uh, is that the mood is always for the benefit of that living being. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just like if you're interacting with people outside of a Krishna consciousness movement, what is the proper mood to interact with others? Just be respectful, that's all. We respect the non-devotees because they're also Krishna's parts and parson. We may not associate with them or even agree with them, but still there's, the respect is because they are also living beings, spiritual beings. Yeah. That's Yastrik. <laughs> okay, let's see. Move on here. Here you go. I should have brought this up sooner. <laughs> What's happening on the bottom there? Yeah. Go ahead. You got it. You were. Akrura taking Krishna Balaram to Vrindavan. Akrura is uh, taking Krishna Vrindavan. Balaram away. And what's what's going on? And gopis are trying to protect. Uh, gopis, sorry, stop. Yeah. gopis don't like it. They're falling in front. Of, they're trying to stop the horses falling in front of the chariot. Don't expect utopia. <laughs> it's not like that. If you want utopia, go back to Godhead. It's, then it's always a struggle. Hmm. Here's sh- what we were talking about. Who wants to read? One of the ladies. Mataji, yeah. can read. People should not. No, wait, wait. Let's let's give some of the ladies a chance. Yeah, we're an equal opportunity employer here. <laughs> yes. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Is that Shivangi? Shivani. Shivangi. Okay. People should. People should. People should not expect that even in the Krishna consciousness society there will be utopia because devotees are persons. Therefore, they will always be some. There will always be some lacking. But the difference is that their lacking have become transcendental because. Despite everything they may do, their topmost intention is to serve Krishna. Yeah. So where where is the connection there? Everyone's trying to serve Krishna, but there may be some differences. There may be some lackings. There may be some, you know, disagreements. But still, these are not so important. These are not so important. These are not so important. <laughs> We have to get over these little differences and go on with our spiritual life. If we make the little things into big things, then we will miss out on the big things. So, okay, let's see if there's something related to that. There's a long discussion here, but I think it's too long to read. Okay.
Okay. It is not so much that because there may be some faults in our God brothers and God sister, or because they may have be some mismanagement or lack of cooperation, that is due to being impersonalists. No. It is the nature of the living condition to always have some fault. But it's not the same as material fault or material envy because it's transcendental. It's all based on Krishna. Sometimes when one gopi would serve Krishna very nicely, the others would say, Oh, she has done so nicely, now let me do better for pleasing Krishna. That is envy, but it is transcendental, without malice. So we should not expect that anywhere there will be any utopia. Rather, that is impersonalist, to expect the utopia. You know, we just have to work out our disagreements and our mm, misunderstandings. Story, I'll tell you a story. Would you like to hear a story? Nobody said anything. Okay, okay. Thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> the, the, the speaker needs encouragement too, you know. <laughs> so there was one, Prabhupada was there, and one very distinguished, I guess very important guest came in and Prabhupada was talking to him and he turned to one devotee who was with him and said, "Bring, please bring some Mahaprasadam immediately. He wanted to give it to the guest. So the devotee went into the Pujari room and the Pujari had just put the offering on the altar and he said, you're going to have to wait. It's just on the altar and it'll be about 10 minutes. So the devotee came back and told Prabhupada the offering just went on. We'll have to wait 10 minutes. Prabhupada said, no, bring it now. <laughs> so he went back in. At that time, the Pujari was doing his Gayatri after the month, after he put it on the altar. So the devotee walked right on the altar and took the plates off the altar <laughs> while the Pujari was doing his Gayatri. So you can imagine what kind of Gayatri that was. <laughs> So the devotee's walking out with the plates and the pujari's running after him. <laughs> and they both got the Prabhupada at the same time. So and then, of course, Prabhupada cleared the air of all the misunderstanding. But there, these are sometimes these things happen, you know. We have an instruction, but someone else has another instruction or another way of doing the same thing. And there's what is called miscommunication. And Krishna says in Gita, what is that verse? Marta sparsas tu kuntaya, sit no sna sukha dukada, agapa ino nichas, tamsi tiksva bharata. That happiness and distress are like the changing of the seasons. They rise from what? Sense perception. So my sense perception may be different than your sense perception. So that may cause misunderstanding. So, but, you know, then we should try to work that out without going away or becoming angry. Like that. So, that's called communication. Okay. So, topmost intention is to serve Krishna despite there may be faults. You know. So, overlook the faults of others and work on your own faults. <laughs> that's important. Okay, next one. Any questions about this one? Don't don't expect utopia. Sri Guru, you have something? Oh, okay. All right. Any? We'll go on to the next one. Find universe, unity in diversity. Okay. Who knows where that is? Hmm. Someone said New Vrindavan. Bhaktivedanta Manor. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> it's good to be honest. Feels good also. <laughs> but I thought it was Bhaktivedanta Manor. That's what I thought. But yeah, it could be New Vrindavan because that looks like some of Prabhupada's moods at New Vrindavan. He had that mood. I'm not sure, actually. So, okay. So, someone can read? Then the 
materialist without being able to adjust the varieties and the disagreements makes everything zero. They cannot come into agreement with varieties, but if we keep Krishna in the center, then there will be agreement in varieties. This is called unity and diversity. Yeah. Next. I'm therefore suggesting that all our men meet in Mayapur every year during the birth anniversary of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. With all GBC and senior men present, we should discuss how to make university, unity in diversity. It's not an easy thing. You have to discuss it. What's the unity? Hmm? Krishna in the center. Yeah. Yeah, that's the unity. Uh, what's the diversity? Hmm? Diversity is, I want to serve, I think this is the best way to serve, you think this is the best way to serve. Yeah. This is the best way to preach, no, we should preach this way. <laughs> so, some diversity. Still, Krishna is the center. Prabhupada said that's not, that's not, uh, diverse, that's not dissension or separation. Because the unity is there. When there's no unity, then there's only diversity, and then we have chaos. And when there's only unity and no diversity, it's really boring. <laughs> it doesn't work. Because you're, you're not acknowledging the creative and unique qualities of each and every individual. You can't just shut that out. Everybody should go out on books. Everyone should be a book distributor. Or everyone should, you know, be a pujari. It's not like that. That's also part of good management. The temple leaders have to see how to keep unity and diversity within the temple where the, the unity is, is going on in terms of the service that is required. But the devotees are satisfied within their service. And... How we understand that is to put the needs of the devotee over the needs of the temple. That's the, the principle of unity and diversity. When the devotees are nicely engaged, the activities of the temple seem to work nicely. If the temple puts the, the importance of the temple first without the needs of the devotees or how to best engage devotees, it'll go on for some time and then we lose devotees. And then things start falling apart. So that's one. That's my discussion on it. Anybody else? Yes? An Acharya? I mean, uh, Acharya. But, uh, the Acharya as, <laughs> Asraya. When you, when you talk about Asraya, you have to talk about Acharya, right? <laughs> it's a synonymous word. <laughs> Correct, Mataji? Is that yes? No, she's not agreeing. <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> um, we, like you were mentioning, it doesn't mean everybody's going to do this activity, this one, that one, whatever is required, but it seems, not seems like, just to give a reference, back in, quote unquote, the day, you know, everybody just kind of did what Prabhupada said. Um, you're going to go out for Harinam for 10 hours a day, you know. <laughs> that's not my propensity, but that's what the, that's what's required. In the beginning, it was like that because... But Prabhupada knew that that couldn't go on. I mean, he had ultimately he had to develop a social and a system where, you know, both the needs of the devotees and the needs of this organization went on simultaneously. In the beginning, it was the needs of the organization, one hundred percent. Prabhupada knew that he was doing that. He was, but he was taking a risk because it just was. We just had. He, he, his age was over seventy. He was thinking, "I got to spread this movement as fast as I can." So he was. Devotees were just surrendering to whatever they had to, to surrender to, and some of them made it, and some of them didn't, because it was tough in those days. It was really tough. <laughs> I mean, look what happened trying to build that temple in Bombay. You know, it was really difficult. Devotees had nothing. They had to live on a, on a rat-infested, mosquito-infested land with no temple there and just stay there. They were living in huts, you know, and they were all Westerners, not accustomed to the Indian climate, the Indian culture. It was very difficult. Devotees were getting sick. 
But still, Prabhupada pushed it because he, he wanted that temple. It was very difficult. But Prabhupada knew that after, after a while we have to set up a system, a system for, for engaging people properly. We're not on an emergency, what we say, we're, we're not on the emergency level right now. The emergency was at the beginning. Now it's more like intelligent organization, how to intelligently organize our resources and our devotees. Can I expand the yeah. question a little bit more? Thank you for your answer, Maharaj. Um, I, I completely accept the first part, this, the communication. I, believe, I accept what you said. So, um, With the discussion of Varnashram and this being a very important aspect of moving into the future, there's also a kind of, can kind of be a sense of discontent, uh, like, oh, I don't have what I deserve kind of feeling can come. Um, so my, my uh, appreciation of this particular presentation or something that I thought maybe it would foster for us is a sense of the desire to sacrifice for this great personality although we haven't come to a stage where everything is there that I would want to have for right. myself or something like that you know? yeah well sometimes it's required It's not always, that's why Prabhupada was making the point, things are not always ideal, but still we have to continue with our service despite less than ideal circumstances. If we put it, what we need over our service, then we'll be doing that all the time. <laughs> and another principle is that we serve and Krishna takes care of our needs. That's also true. So, there's a question now, and this is, I'm, I'm asking everyone, what would block our attempts to find unity and diversity? What would block our attempts to create unity and diversity? Uh, okay, the, question, the microphone's coming to Sri Guru. False ego? False ego. Yeah. Right. That blocks everything, not just unity and diversity. <laughs> it blocks Krishna too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. False ego would be one. What, what, what's another thing that would block unity and diversity? We have right, yeah. And uh, finding fault. Yeah. Can you explain? Uh, because the tendency to think my way is the right way. Uh, the other person is not right, or why can't they see it right, or cannot appreciate, uh, you know, many things, but fault finding in general. Mm. Finding fault with other people's opinions and ideas. That's right. Yeah, obviously that's a very big part of blocking. So avoid that, yes. Non-cooperative spirit? Not Non-cooperative spirit? Yeah, obviously. Cooperation is the basis of all success in anything we do. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Jani Kinath? Um, uh, selfish motives or selfish desires. Yeah, that's a good one. When we put ourselves in the center, then all of a sudden the unity is lost. Uh, competitive mentality. Competitiveness. Trying to outdo someone in... Correct. And I also have another one. But in a, what we say, a materialistic way. Material way, yes. Yeah, in other words, I want to be noticed, I don't want Krishna to notice you. <laughs> you cooked a nice offering, but I'm going to take your offering and hide it so nobody... <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's happened before. I'm not just making that up. <laughs> oh, how do you all? <laughs> So, you know, Krishna can't appreciate what you can. So that, that's really strong envy, you know. Any of the ladies? Yes, over here. Mataji. Neglecting spiritual uh, chanting and hearing. Oh, without a, a strong spiritual, without, without strong purity. sadhana? I, 
I feel that without purity, people can uh, cannot come to that level of cooperation because they will That's never have That's a good point. That. That's a good point. Without the purity there, then it becomes hard to co actually create unity and diversity. So the purity is enhanced by proper hearing and chanting. Very good point, yeah. I think that's a good point then to understand that to create unity and diversity, that's why Prabhupada said we have to discuss it with the senior persons. It's not so easy to create unity and diversity. Acharya Nishta. I'm getting to learn, learn I'm getting to know everybody's name slowly. This was kind of mentioned, but uh, narrow mindedness and closed mindedness. Closed mindedness, my way or the highway? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's today. Uh, uh, Richard was next. The same thing that he just said, Maharaj, that uh, I was appreciating, you mentioned the other day, a genius can hold two opposing concepts. That's in the nectar devotion. So. Yeah, the... Um, it says in Nectar Devotion, the, the qualification of a genius is they can hold two opposing points in their mind simultaneously and still function. So, yeah, unity and diversity is apparently sometimes two different, two different opinions trying to work to somehow focus on service together. We have to work that out. We also have to be tolerant of other people's ideas and opinions. We also have to really value other people's services. I think that's important to understand. A person may be doing a lot of service, or a person may be doing a little service, but what was this? who knows the story in relationship to that? Let's see who's really sharp about that one. <laughs> the ladies flew up their hands over there. Okay, we have to give the ladies some ch The question was, there's a story that talks about how, you know, not the, uh, uh, someone's little amount of service was appreciated just as much as someone's great amount of service. Uh, I have to, we have to acquiesce to the temple president. He's... We have to, no, let Nityananda Pran answer this because he, he's the temple president. <laughs> the, you got the floor. Oh, okay, you're giving it to Leela Manjari. Okay. <laughs> That's unity and diversity. <laughs> She's one of your best students. <laughs> I yeah. heard it from him. Oh. <laughs> Make sure you get the right story now. There's only one I know of. Maybe there's more. Um, while they were trying to build the bridge to Lanka, ah. then uh, Hanuman was actually throwing a lot of stones into the ocean. Right. And then there was a little spider who was also trying to make an attempt to throw something. And then it was recognized that the spider's attempt was just as nice as Lord Hanuman's. Well, Hanuman said to the spider, get out of the way, right? Because, you know, we don't really need you. <laughs> and Ham, and Ram, Ram took issue with Hanuman. Said, hey, he's doing as much as you are. He's working to his capacity, and you're working to your capacity. That's the point. That's the point. If someone is trying their best, then even if it's less than someone else, it's still seen by Krishna as they're both equal. You know, so Krishna consciousness is not material. Yes, uh, Shiva, Shivani? Yeah, I thought of another story wherein Dukhi was arranging the pots for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Abhishek. Who was arranging the pots? Dukhi. Huh? Dukhi. Do, who? Doki? Oh, Dookie. Yeah. <laughs> Not Doki. That's Dokla. <laughs> Dookie. <laughs> no, do Doklas are later on today. <laughs> Dookie. <laughs> yes, okay. You did your best, I understand. <laughs> <laughs>
Krishna, Krishna understood, I couldn't understand. <laughs> yeah, Duki. She was serving, she was standing in the water, handing the pots to the other devotees, and they were bathing Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya acknowledged that her service was just as good or even better because she didn't want any recognition. She just simply wanted to assist the other devotees. She became what? Servant of the servant of the servant. So the more you become servant, the more you become glorified in the eyes of Krishna, in the eyes of those who know. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea is to try to serve. <laughs> yes, Sri Guru? And then Mataji, you can, you're next. There is this one other story, I don't remember perfectly, about the banana peels. Who? Banana peels. Banana, pe banana peels? Oh, Vidura's wife, yeah. 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 She got confused. <laughs> She was doing her best. She was giving banana, Krishna banana peels instead of the banana. That's such a wonderful pastime that they actually wrote a song based on that story. <laughs> Who knows the song? I say prema pujari radhe sham 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 Jaya Kesava Madhavala Hari Radhe Sham Shama Sham Radhe Sham That's one of my favorite pastimes. Yes, Mataji. Do you have your huh? you don't want to say speak? Okay. <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> In the Krishna book, there is a pastime of uh, King Bahulashwa and Shrutadeva Brahmana. Ah. And Krishna visits both their houses simultaneously. Hmm. And both are serving to their capacity. And Krishna yeah. is there. And Krishna is accepting that. Also, Sudama Brahma couldn't offer anything to Krishna, but Krishna accepted his very meager offering as the best possible offering you could get. Raghunath Das Goswami was eating the rejected rice that the cows wouldn't eat at the, uh, what was the name of that? The Kailung, Tailunga cows at the, what was that gate in the, the Simhadwar gate? Yeah, at the uh, Jagannath Puri temple. Lord Chaitanya came and saw it and started stealing the rice from Raghunath Das. And Lord Chaitanya said, this rice... I've tasted curries and, and sweets and so many subjis and so many wonderful preparations. But what Raghunath Das goes is the best of all. What he was tasting was the bhakti, not the rice, but the, the bhakti. So Krishna is tasting our bhakti. He's, he likes to eat bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> you serve him a plate of bhakti. <laughs> So, of course, you have to give him something with the bhakti. <laughs> but that the idea is that he eats the bhakti. That's why he leaves the food and eats the bhakti. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, Ashraya Prabhu. Sorry, Ashraya. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking for any of us, this seems like a very important question, and you were expressing something to us the other day that I won't specifically name, but um, in the spirit of cooperation, there will be circumstances, even for a personality of your stature that you were expressing, where there's circumstances that we can't change within the institution, although we recognize, wow, this is really not, you know, what it, what it, what it could be. Yeah, nothing's ideal. I, well, <laughs> even what you were expressing was way beyond... Not ideal, but... Um, the only place you find ideal Hare Krishna performance is in kirtans. <laughs> Outside of that, there's so many problems. <laughs> it's just the way it is. But still, we have to work with that. <laughs> yes. So, so you, I'm just asking for some, maybe your personal expression for our benefit. What's the, um, what's the consciousness of, of a devotee in that circumstance that I'm... 
I, there's nothing that I can do. Maybe, you know, for instance, in relation to his question, some devotees might leave and say, I don't want to be a part of this thing. Other, but so many devotees like yourself have stayed with it and done whatever little bit they could. You've know. you got to learn how to roll with the punches. <laughs> Therefore, if you want to make it in any part of life, you have to learn two things, tolerance and patience. Whether you're a, a day-to-day worker in the material world or a Hare Krishna trying to become a pure devotee, you've got to have patience and tolerance. And you have to also be intelligent and know how to use your patience and tolerance in such a way that it, 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 makes, it, it brings you about greater understanding and greater surrender. And so, therefore, Prabhupada was talking this morning, I was listening, he was talking about utsaha nishchaya daryat. Enthusiasm, determination, and patience. And if we have enthusiasm but no patience... Well, that will be, it will be very difficult to be determined in all circumstances. If we have patience but no enthusiasm, nothing is going to happen, really. It's just going to just slowly go along. You need both. You need to be enthusiastic, but you need to be patient at the same time. With the element of tolerance, it's just the way it is. We have to tolerate two, we have to tolerate two different categories. Um... The tolerance that comes by way of living in the material world and having a material body, and the tolerance that comes by way of circumstances that put us in, into difficulty because of, of either other people or of, because of Krishna's arrangement. And there's two verses. Each one of those complement these two types of tolerance. The first one is Marta Sparsus to Kuntia, Sit Nusna. You have to tolerate happiness, distress, heat and cold, honor, dishonor, convenience, inconvenience. You know. You can go on the long list of different dualities of this material world that we like and don't like. Even the likes we have to tolerate, because sometimes liking the wrong thing is not good. <laughs> And then the other one is tate nu kampam shushikshimikshimanam bhujane vat kritam pipakam ridvapa hubir viridana maste jiveti of yumukti padesha dayaba. Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna, but learn this verse along with your chanting. He said, you, This verse will, will, will carry you through the Krishna consciousness movement. What is that verse saying? My dear Lord, somehow or other you've put me into this difficult situation. And really, I'm thanking you for this situation because actually the difficulties you're giving me is much less than I actually deserve. I deserve worse, but because of your mercy, somehow or other, you only give me a token of how the suffering that I'm supposed to get. And then the verse ends, Mukti Padesha Dayabak. That means that one is guaranteed, just like a son or a daughter will automatically inherit the property of the parents if they simply stay in the family. That's all. They get it if they just stay in the family. So if you just stay in Krishna consciousness, you'll go back home, back to Godhead. So mukti padesha dayabak. The kingdom of God becomes one's rightful inheritance. That's the, the term. So yeah, it takes tolerance. Tolerance is a very important principle in Krishna consciousness. That's why Lord Chaitanya talked about it a lot and emphasized it in his prayers. Learn to tolerate without going away. <laughs> yes? You're smiling. <laughs> I was wondering what that smile was about. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we should smile. It's easier to tolerate that way. <laughs> if you go to the material world and you deal with material energy, you're going to have to tolerate it anyway. But that kind of tolerance doesn't really bring you any real benefit. You just tolerate for the sake of tolerance, that's all. But in spiritual life, you know, by developing tolerance... You're making advancement. 
you're developing the qualities that is necessary to take shelter of Krishna's holy name. You can chant better. The more you become tolerant, the more you can chant the holy name. Okay. On principles and details, we mentioned this yesterday. Um, Prabhupada, how can we tell the difference between making an adjustment and changing a principle? Prabhupada closed his eyes and I continued to rub his body. Finally, he opened his eyes and responded, that requires a little intelligence. <laughs> So, yeah, it requires some intelligence. I mean, let's, let's read something in this regard. Let's see if what's coming up here. Here, and this is by Borijan. To foolishly mistake a non-adjustable principle for an adjustable detail will cause havoc in spiritual life. And to accept each detail as if it can never be adjusted is fanaticism. Fan fa fanaticism. Fanaticism will cause havoc of a different nature. Okay, everyone understand that? What's a detail? What's a principle? What's the difference between a detail and a principle? Oh. This one we should discuss a little bit. All right, here's the question. How, how we become mature enough to, how can we become mature enough to discern a principle from details? What is the way to discern a principle from a detail? Remember, a principle is non adjustable, a detail is adjustable. What's an example? I guess that would be an easier way to, yes, Prabhu, what would be an example? Microphone. Let's say, uh, let's say um, there is somebody running with a knife after a woman, and I have a house, I open the door, I save the woman. Mm. And the principle might be one should tell the truth, but at that time, place, and circumstance, it might not be appropriate. The proper thing to do is tell a lie that the woman went that way. To protect the person. Protect yeah. The person. yeah, that's a good one. That's adjusting. The details according to time, place, and circumstance. The principle is truthfulness. The adjustment is to protect the life of someone. Yeah, very good. That's a very excellent one. I didn't think of that one. Yes, Leela Munjari? Srila Rupa Goswami says that he discusses pri principles in Nectar of Devotion and he says one must accept a spiritual master, but details could be how each spiritual master gives individual guidance. Exactly. That's from Rupa Goswami. I think I have this here. Yeah. So one, the principle is one must accept a spiritual master. And how that spiritual master uh, disseminates transcendental that may be a detail. Because <laughs> you get one spiritual master may give one, not difference in direction, but difference in how to approach, you know, sadhana service like that. What, what, what are some of the details Prabhupada adjusted and got criticized for? We got, wow, six, 1,600 hands went up. <laughs> I don't know who I should call on. <laughs> That's a detail. <laughs> Maria, you have your. Now what? What are some? What is one of the? What's one of the per, details that Prabhupada adjusted? A woman pujari. A woman pujari. Yeah. Well, woman in the temple. That's just having women living in the temple. That's never done in India before. Prabhupada said I was criticized for that too. Heavily and continuously, even today, they take issue with that. But Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's response was, I've become successful because I did that. 
That was his response. I have proven that 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 adjustment was actually the best thing because I have become successful for allowing that. Yes, Nityananda Pran. Given giving Brahman Diksha to Westerners. Yeah. Not born in Brahman families. Yeah, that's that's also that's a that's an adjustment according to qualification as opposed to birth. And that's that's actually Shastric like that. Janaki Nath. Uh, Marge, what about Prabhupada reducing the rounds to sixteen? Sixteen rounds, yeah. He had adjust the apparent uh, Gaudiya Mass standard of a sixty four rounds. Yeah, because we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it for many reasons. But one of the reasons we complained about it was too much service. No time to chant 64 rounds. Yes. Uh, what's another adjustment? Let's see if you can come up with one. Um, when, thank you, Maharaj Hare Krishna. Go ahead. Um, when Prabhupada um, asked the Pujari to take the um, offering off the altar and give it to the guest. Yeah, that was adjusting of a, a, a detail. But some people say that was maybe something he shouldn't have did, but he did it. <laughs> he had the vision that it's more important to give this, this person prasadam right away than to lose... Maybe he had that person's favor or whatever. Richard? Was it uh, against deity worship for Prabhupada to allow the Radhadamador deities to travel on, on the van? Usually Radha and Krishna deities don't travel like that. They only take Radha and Krishna deities out on the palanquin in certain festival days. And then you don't take the big deities out, you take the the uh, Utsahab deities, the festival deities, the small deities. So yeah, that was also. Okay, let's go to another point. What's a non-adjustable principle? What's something you can't adjust? I've had a lot of experience with that being in New Vrindavan. <laughs> <laughs> What's a non-adjustable, something you can't change? Regulative principles. Huh? Four regulative principles. Yeah, but some people are trying. <laughs> <laughs> they say four regulative principles. No no eating meat, fish, no drinking coffee, and, and no and no eggs. Four principles. <laughs> <laughs> Follow these four. <laughs> You get your choice which four you want to choose. <laughs> Multiple choice. <laughs> it's really go it would probably really go over good in America. <laughs> so yeah, that's the four regulative principles. Boy, I have to fight for that. I just put I just put a thing on my website or on my conference about the four regulative principles. You should have seen the backlash I got. Whoa. <laughs> From senior devotees too. But I, I defended myself anyway. <laughs> it was a good fight. Uh, so, what else? What's something else that cannot be adjusted? Yes, Mataji. Well, yeah, but some instructions are, are what we say, maybe time, place, and circumstance. You mean individual instructions or general instructions? Individual. In individual instructions, yeah, that's a principle. But general instructions, we have to see how they apply. Time, place. It's like what it says here to accept each detail as if it could never be adjusted is fanaticism. I know of some devotees who like to make everything exactly the way Prabhupada said it, but Prabhupada also said, use your intelligence apply the principles according to time, place, and circumstance. And there's where that first thing comes, to know 
what's a detail and what's a, a non-adjustable principle and how to act accordingly. And that was brought out in a conversation by Prabhupada to Giriraj Maharaj when he asked Giriraj Maharaj in a very serious and grave mood. Prabhupada was translating his Bhagavatam in the middle of the night. It was about one in the morning and he rang Giriraj Brahmachari to, and he woke him up. Giriraj was sleeping outside of Prabhupada's door as his bodyguard. He came running in. Prabhupada said, how will this movement go on once I leave? <laughs> so he wanted to hear the answer. So Giriraj said, well, you know, Prabhupada will distribute your books and we'll chant, that we'll, do, we'll have Harinams and, you know, the activities. Prabhupada just listened and then he finds that, he said, this movement will go on by organization and intelligence. It takes some intelligence to apply the principles according to time, place, and circumstance. So it's not so easy to be a devotee, and it's a lot harder to be a manager. <laughs> so, take some intelligence. And intelligence has to be coupled with sincerity. I sincerely want to do the right thing. Therefore, I'm using my intelligence to try to understand how to do, how to do the best thing. If that's not there, then the intelligence really is damaged by what we say personal motivation. Yes? There's an interesting story from Malati Prabhu about this, about using intelligence, um, or she says common sense, that in the old days, you know, they might have been trying so hard to follow these principles, but they weren't necessarily using common sense, where she said that, um, you know, when she was pregnant with her child, that she was going through all these things, you know, fasting for Kadashi, fasting all of Janmastami and things like that. And, you know, because they felt like this is what they were supposed to do, but that Prabhupada expected they would use some common sense. And she said that at a certain point she wasn't even able to breastfeed her child anymore because she was fasting so often. <laughs> so she just couldn't even take care of her kid. Yeah. I'm sure when Malati tells it, it's, it goes right to the core of your heart. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah... In those days, things weren't so clear. We just did it. It's a rule, it's a regulation, we got to do it. We didn't consider it. Yeah, just like when women would get pregnant in our movement, the, devote, the women that were living in the temple, of course, mostly everybody was temple, they would, have to, they would cook separately for those women. And they would have to eat very simple, non-spicy food because it wasn't so good to give, you know, the, the normal fare to the ladies, because in those days, the brashadam was quite spicy and rich. <laughs> you know, a lot of ghee, a lot of chilies. <laughs> so we had to cook separate for the ladies who were pregnant like that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's another one. So there's certain things you can't adjust, Yes. Huh? If you permit, I have a story, story about adjusting something. How to, something that can be adjusted? Something that was adjusted. It's a funny story. Okay. Um, I believe this is in New Vrindavan. New Vrindavan. New Vrindavan. Oh, there's unlimited adjustments. I'm sure there are. <laughs> I could write a book on all the adjustments. <laughs> Some of them were not adjustable either. <laughs> That would be a good idea for a book. You just gave me an idea. I could write a book on the things we adjusted in Nuvrindavan and have a section for the non-adjustable adjustables. <laughs> the ones that were non-adjustable but got adjusted anyway. <laughs> that would be a bestseller title, Marx. Okay, I don't want to take away from your... No, not at all. Uh, um, <laughs> so I, I, I might mess up on the details. Perhaps you were there and so you know the details. But uh, apparently the devotees had cooked cauliflower and peas sabji in big quantity because a lot of devotees were there. And after the offering was all made, someone said, Oh, today is Ekadashi. 
And so they couldn't throw away all that prasadam. They can't feed it to the devotees also. So when the devotees came and everyone was served, they were told not to eat and they made an announcement. Haribol Prabhus, today is Ekadashi. Just remove all the peas from the subject. I was traveling during that time. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I I heard about that one. <laughs> I'm I'm really glad I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, let me ask you this: What would you would do in that circumstance? I would say, Hari Bol Prabhus, please remove the peace from this house. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what Prabhupada would would sanction too. <laughs> that would be the most sensible thing because. To throw all that away and at the same time there was nothing else. You know. That's not, that's both funny and very, very what we say, intelligent. <laughs> I think that's intelligent. So let's see what we got left here. Who's that? Who's that writing there? And who's that coming along the path? She's going to do what? She's going to give him something. He wants to, he wants, who knows the pastime? Who knows the pastime? Kirtida, do you know the pastime? Let's see. We got, who, who hasn't said anything yet today? <laughs> 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 She's been silent. <laughs> Nila Mantra, you want you know the pastime? Um, I, I think it was Sanadan Goswami's um, some special day about him, birthday or something, and. Um, uh, Srimati Radharani came to Rupa Goswami and she said, can you please take the smoke and cook it for him? And um, Sanatan Goswami ate the sweet rice and he could immediately tell from the taste of the sweet rice that it was something very special. So he asked Rupa Goswami how he got the milk and he ultimately understood that it was Srimati Shri Radharani who made the arrangement. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what it has to do with this thing, but, but anyway. <laughs> it has nothing to do with this caption at all. <laughs> it's unity and diversity. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's a very important principle. I think we should discuss this one. Associating with what? Someone want to read? One must associate with like-minded Vaishnavas who are pure, more elevated, and realized. Yeah. Why? Why, Luke? Why, why should we do that? Oh. Uh, that's how we make advancement. Yeah. Like-minded says that there's so many opportunities for association. There are so many persons we can take association with. But take association for those persons who are who you can relate to like that. Well, usually we choose a spiritual master based on that also. And there's some what we say like mindedness within the between the disciple and the spiritual master too. And just like sometimes I know certain gurus in our movement, they turn away prospective di disciples because they say, you're not my disciple. I can see our moods are completely different, so you would do better with another spiritual master like that. So it's coming down on that side. Usually we choose someone who is more like like-minded or someone whose nature is very similar or something like that. There's some similarity or some connection there. So, yeah, so it's recommended. That way communication is much more 
what's the word? Sanguine, sublime, natural. So like-minded, even in association with other devotees, uh, it mentions that we should be friendly to everyone and have a few friends also. So you can't have everyone as your friend in the sense that it's not possible to develop a friendship relationship with everyone, but everyone you should be friendly with everyone, that's Vaishnava. And there's a few people you have, you share your friendship with, like that. So that's there. Okay, this is the next lesson, fictional Prabhupada. Okay, we just went, any more questions on unity and diversity, love is to cooperate, details, principles, don't expect utopia, don't expect prashadam to always be perfect. <laughs> yes. Yes, Maharaj. I'm still confused on the point of diversity and, and where it comes from. Does it come from our materialistic conceptions or does it come from each one of us having an individual relationship with Krishna or a combination? Well, hopefully we, we want to get it to the point where it's our materialistic diversity, our different materialistic personalities and likes and dislikes can be used in Krishna's service. As one, unless they're used in Krishna's service, then they're just diversity, there's no unity. Only when Krishna is the center is unity and diversity can work. It works in a material world too, when there's one common goal and everyone's working towards that common goal from different angles. But they're all focused on the same common goal. So, yeah, it doesn't really matter about our material diversities as long as the unity is there and then those material diversities can be engaged in devotional service. And then they're no longer material, they're spiritual then. And then that's really... But, but if we don't engage in devotional service or if we don't focus on Krishna as the goal of everything we do, then our diversity becomes just an expression of our own individual desires. In the beginning of Krishna consciousness, sometimes it's like that. We really don't know, or we don't really have an understanding what it means to serve Krishna. So we may be more emphasizing on our own what I like, as opposed to what Krishna likes or what the spiritual master wants. But that has to change as we make advancement. As we stay in, we start pushing aside our own individual likes and dislikes and start focusing on what, what Krishna wants, what the spiritual master expects from us. And then we can create real unity and diversity. That's why Prabhupada said, you have to, the leaders have to meet and discuss it, how to do it. It's not so easy. Because there is a lot of diversity. But to keep the unity there is, can be very difficult. Can I ask yeah. another question following that up? Yeah. So on the, the neophyte platform, we're supposed to take our likes and kind of dovetail that into service towards Krishna and gradually those... Yeah, in the beginning out. it's dovetailing. After a while it's actually coming to the stage of offering when, you know, your love for Krishna in a certain a service attitude. But in the beginning it's, all right, you came in, what do you like to do? Okay, you don't like to do anything? All right, here, do this. <laughs> <laughs> You like to just sit there and look at the deity. <laughs> well, okay, we'll let you do it for ten minutes, but <laughs> please do something else. <laughs> you know, and we have to. I think it's been mentioned many times, and it's actually the feature. Unless we actually come to the platform of wanting to serve, our spiritual life doesn't really be, really develop. We have to offer our service. We have to do something for Krishna. We're doing something for ourselves, our family, our body, whatever else. 
got to start doing it for Krishna. Then, that, then our whole life changes. When we actually offer our time and energy to Krishna, then, then we're starting to make progress like that. Yeah. There's a bunch of hands. Yes. Uh, Shivangi. Shivani. Shivani. Bring the microphone up close. I was just thinking about this instruction by Srila Rupa Goswami wherein one, like he instructs that one must associate, it, as, as, associate with like senior devotees who are more elevated. So I was just thinking that how would a neophyte devotee advance in his or her Krishna consciousness if everyone would seek association of only elevated Vaishnavas? <laughs> well, <laughs> Hare Krishna. I think we'd have a wonderful society <laughs> and then there would be more elevated devotees I think uh, there was a somewhat of a recent uh, evaluation about association in terms of percentage that you should associate 50% with peers 20% with seniors and something like at 70, 30%, 25%, like with juniors. With juniors, you preach or you elevate. With, with, you, well, you spend most of your time with peers. That's generally the case. That's the majority of the association. But you'd also seek out the association of advanced devotees. And what does associate to advanced devotees mean? It means two things. You offer some time and service. What can you, you offer? Can I do some service? And the other thing is you hear from them. You get some guidance, spiritual direction. You hear the classes. By hearing classes, that's association also. But also from the day-to-day -day life, we can go to places where, you know, programs are going on and senior devotees are there. And then we can also hear from them and also offer some personal service like that. What can I do? How can I serve? If we, if we can't make that question, we're never going to make any advancement. How can I serve? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Asraya Prabhu, you had a question? And we'll quit at 12.30 sharp. So that's 10 minutes. I was trying to think of an example of Srila Prabhupada, but I guess I don't know enough about his interactions with devotees. But from my experience, one way that the unity and diversity works one way is that um, because some of us are diverse on the material platform, um, and we can't see, understand things without having somebody who's like-minded that it, it's easier for us to understand, but those who are more advanced, they can, between themselves, see who would be able to communicate better to that person. And because they have a higher understanding, they can just, you know, branch out differently. Maybe, you know, my spiritual master, something I'm not getting from him or something, but he knows this person will be able to express it to me. So he will reach through that person to help me understand it, for instance. So having that... Um, broader perspective of what, ways to reach people brings the same message but it doesn't have to come from me because I'm the you know, spiritual master or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's recommended. It's not always possible either because of time, place and person. Yeah. Uh, I think if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, you'll see that you know devotees were getting association and instructions from various persons although Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also there. That's Vaishnav culture, yeah. We might not be able to see it, therefore we can ask advice, well, where else can I get instructions and guidance from? We should be eager for Krishna consciousness. If we're not eager, then things won't happen. <laughs> we'll just go along. <laughs> what does it mean, eager mean? You have to be fired up. Was it fired up means you have to, it's like 
if you're just very passive in your Krishna consciousness, or very limited in what you do and say, then sometimes you miss out on all the nectar. <laughs> it takes active. Okay. Yes. Janaki, you have another question? Well, just, just a quick clarification. Uh, yesterday you mentioned the founder Acharya is the one who can um, uh, ch adjust the details uh, based on time, place, and circumstance. Yeah. So I was just thinking, Maharaj, in the future when time is changing, circumstances are changing, then some details may need to be adjusted. adjusted then I'm just curious who would do that in, in, in the future when it when it's, needs to be done. Well, not everyone can do it. In circumstances, you may be able to do something, but on a general sense, if you're going to adjust a, a detail according that will affect in the long run, then that has to come from, you know, Acharya or a spiritual leader. It should be sanctioned by the GBC also. Just like, one of, what's one of the things we're doing now? We're preaching to people in, in the yoga arenas. And going to these yoga programs, and and we're also teaching our devotees to be yogis, <laughs> doing different hathas, asanas like that, but not for spiritual advancement, for health. So these are adjustable things. You have to see what see what the results are. If you're going to these yoga programs and you're preaching and people are coming forward, then. That's good. And if there's no results, then you can see it's not it's not a good adjustment. Vaishnava. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I was I kept thinking about um, compassion, even though it was kind of mentioned. Nice and loud, so everyone can hear. I, I kept thinking about compassion. But I'm not sure if my definition is the same as our definition of what is compassion. Um, compassion means concern for the welfare of others and acting, acting for the welfare of others. It's not just concern, it's, act, it's concern in action. Doing something to, to relieve another person's suffering doing something to elevate a person in Krishna consciousness. That's acts of compassion. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So you end there? Oh, okay. Way in the back there. Peter's? Peter. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj Prabhu's. I've been inspired with two thoughts, uh, if you'd like to hear them. One based on unity. A little louder, please. One based on finding unity in diversity and one with the associate with like-minded devotee slides. Okay. Pertaining to the uh, finding unity in diversity, my mind was immediately drawn to uh, the principle of Chinta Veda Veda Tattva. Uh-huh. And... Um, That's the principle, yeah. It's more... more uh, maybe not so practical, but just as a foundational principle that I should think about, that I don't think I'll be able to find unity in diversity while I maintain a atheistic, violent mentality. <laughs> as the... Uh, I don't think so either. <laughs> the the uh, universal body of Krishna being all the diversity, yeah. and if I maintain that it's not... Yeah, Krishna the accommodates the atheists by killing them, that's all. Krishna accommodates the atheists by destroying their atheist mentality. So Krishna can accommodate the atheists by destroying their mentality. We can't do that, or we can try to do that through philosophical. But we can't, uh, you know, we can't bring a, you can bring an atheist into Krishna consciousness, but they can't maintain atheism in Krishna consciousness. There's just no room for it. <laughs> That's like saying, to be Krishna conscious, we have to be un-Krishna conscious. <laughs> no, that doesn't fit in. 
Yeah, accommodation means the center has to be the same. Diversity has to has to focus on unity. In this case, the unity is service to Krishna. Or another principle of unity is uh, the unity around the, the spiritual master's instructions. It's another form of unity. But atheism doesn't work. So you bring them in to make them a non-atheist. <laughs> you have to change that. They have, they have to change or they can't stay, obviously. What is atheism is? It means atheism it means that I don't believe there is a supreme God <laughs> or supreme controller. So it's it's a false belief and therefore it has no no value in, in any arena. It's just someone's uh, um, creation based on two things. Imagination or bad experience. One Christian just recently wrote a book. I wanted to try to get that book. I couldn't get it. Why do athe athe atheism is simply an, an, experience, an example of bad experiences by people in life and they become atheists. But really nobody's an atheist. <laughs> because anybody, even a little kid has common sense. I remember... I was up at Niagara Falls in Canada, the first time I went to see the falls. And uh, I uh, was sitting there watching the water, and next to me was a couple of devotees, and next to us, there was a lady with an eight-year-old boy. The boy was about eight years old. The, the boy said to his mother, Mommy, who created this? Pointing to the falls. And she said, Nature, and then one of our devotees turned to her and said, "God." <laughs> and then she said, "Oh yes, God, God. That's right. Yeah." So the little boy had some understanding that, "Hey, this thing is great. Somebody made it." <laughs> See, her understanding was it's created by nature, but nature is not an answer. Nature is just the energy of God. It's not. The energy doesn't function without the source. Unity and diversity. <laughs> so yeah, so this 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 it's common sense that there's God there's there is a supreme creator. That's created things that are not created by us. Who created them? That's common sense. So an atheist, a person does, that really needs some common sense. <laughs> to put it very simply. <laughs> so you can't really accommodate diversity and unity with an atheist. Second question was on principle and detail. Just trying to connect the slide to the the title of it. That um, he he shared the sweet rice with somebody that was able to appreciate or understand his internal the internal you know phenomenon that was happening. So this is maybe doing to a pro appropriate association of like-minded individuals. You know, if he would have shared the sweet rice with me, I would have been non-appreciative and just been like, oh, whatever. It's little prasad gone in my way. Hmm. Just in a meager attempt to connect the picture and the story to the title. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the story and the picture was... I have to ask Sureshwar Prabhu why he put that one in there. <laughs> so, okay. All right, so we're up to 12.30 and our next program is at 2. So it's only an hour and a half to go. So it gives you enough time to... There's no formal lunch on Sunday? There's lunch at 1 o'clock? Okay. So take some lunch and don't take rest. <laughs> no diversity, just unity. <laughs> 
So the next one is fictional Prabhupada. What Prabhupada is labeled as, is seen as, but actually is not. This is an interesting one. Just to dispel some of the the wrong images about Srila Prabhupada. So this is called fictional Prabhupada. It's a short one, but it's important. And then the last one is our Srila Prabhupada, the real. And this one goes deep into the personality of Prabhupada. And that will be for the Sunday feast program. Which might bewilder about 75% of the congregation. But anyway, <laughs> let's see what happens. Because basically, I said to Sureshwar, you know, I asked him, what lessons should I do? And he said, you know, basically, you know, depends on the type of audience. And I said, some of our audience are newcomers. He said, newcomers will just scratch their heads, that's all. Because <laughs> they don't really know the history of our movement or really the philosophy so well. So for those of you who are newcomers, you know, ask some questions because this is really going a little bit deeper into what is the history, what are some of the problems that have come into our society and what are some of the uh, ways that we should deal with some of these problems and some of the features of our relationship with Prabhupada. So it's a tough seminar for newcomers. <laughs> so, But if you're, stick if you're a newcomer, you're sticking with us, we love you. <laughs> we love everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you. See you at two o'clock. Hare Krishna. See you later, Prabhupada. Kijai. <clears throat>